It all began in the early years of the 19th century in a Burgundy village 90 kilometers from Dijon. At the time, the village had a population of 200. The commune of Fin les Moutiers in the canton of Montbar, department of the Côte d'Or, on the 2nd of May 1806, at 6 o'clock in the evening, Pierre Labouré, the 38 year old owner of the farm, presented to the world his baby daughter, born after his marriage to Madeleine Gontard on the 4th of June, 1793. The child was called Catherine. Next day, May 3rd, 1806, Catherine was baptized Catherine Zoe. She was the Labouré's second daughter and the eighth child of this Christian family. Her mother will have 17 children in 20 years and seven of these will die in infancy. After Catherine will come Tonine, her favorite sister, and then August. October 1815. Madame Labouré dies at the age of 46. Pierre is left to bring up 10 children on his own. Catherine is now nine years old. Later on, a servant will relate how she came to witness a surprising scene. I saw Catherine go towards the main fireplace. She climbed onto a chair, stretched up to the statue of Our Lady, kissed it and said, from now on, you will be my mother. A child's spontaneous action and the forerunner of other occasions when Catherine will reach out towards Mary. January 1818. Marie-Louise, the eldest of the sisters, leaves the family and joins the company of the Daughters of Charity. Catherine is 11 years old. She takes over the domestic work of the farm and says to her sister, The two of us will run the house between us. The Laboré farm prospers and there is plenty of work to be done. Catherine puts in long hours of work every day. She is mistress of the farm and runs the household. There is no priest at Fin. The church has been left empty since the revolution. Catherine comes here to pray every day. And she often walks three kilometers that separate her village from Moutier Saint Jean in order to hear mass. This is the altar where Catherine often received Holy Communion. dream will reveal to Catherine a different way of life. She sees herself in a church at Fin. An old priest with a kindly smile is saying mass and he beckons to her. Then, in her dream, she goes to the bedside of someone who is ill and finds once again the old priest who is a stranger. One day, you will be happy to come to me. God has designs on you. Don't forget this. Four years will pass before she understands these words. You're 18 now, and you should be learning to read. Go to our cousin who has a boarding school at Châtillon-sur-Seine. And it is here at Châtillon, during a visit to the house of the Daughters of Charity, that Catherine discovers the portrait of the priest she had seen in her dream. Who is that priest with the kind smile? Oh. That's St. Vincent de Paul, the founder of our company, the Daughters of Charity. St. Vincent de Paul. A special relationship will develop between him and Catherine. The lowly mistress of the Burgundy farm in the 19th century is going to discover close links with the humble 17th century shepherd from the land who became the greatest saint of his time, the apostle of active charity who worked to relieve every sort of misery, prisoners, abandoned children, the sick and the aged. The poor are our masters. In a century plagued with wars and famine, and in times when colossal fortunes exist alongside the most abject misery, St. Vincent preaches the gospel by his example. He asks himself, 
Miserable wretch, have you earned the bread you're about to eat? This bread that comes to you through the labors of the poor? Action in the face of all forms of misery, making the gospel effective. This is a message for every age. Man of faith and man of action. Monsieur Vincent founds the Confraternities Charity. The priests of the mission will be later known as the Vincentians. And together with Louise de Marillac, he will found the Daughters of Charity, women consecrated to God for the service of the poor. They will have for monastery the houses of the sick, for cell a rented room, for cloister the streets of the city, for enclosure obedience, for veil holy modesty. Today, there are about 27,000 daughters of charity throughout the world. They work with the street children in Rio, with abandoned children in Madagascar, with the homeless in Paris, with women whose husbands have deserted them, with immigrants, the hungry, the excluded, and victims of every kind of oppression and injustice. They share material and spiritual resources with everyone in need. I want to be a daughter of charity. Out of the question. I've already given your sister Marie Louise to God. Your brother in Paris has just lost his wife, so you can go and help him run his restaurant. You might even find a good husband among his clients. Catherine is 22. The peasant girl who speaks with a Burgundian accent discovers what Paris is like. She comes into contact with the world of exploited workers and the drifters of society. Her encounter with this misery strengthens her resolve. I want to be a daughter of charity. Pierre Laboré will eventually give his consent and his daughter Catherine will become a daughter of charity. She will live her vocation to the full by giving herself totally to God in the service of the poor. Her whole life will be a blossoming of the virtues that constitute the spirit of Saint Vincent. Simplicity, humility, charity. Catherine leaves the beautiful countryside of her beloved Burgundy forever. After spending three months with the sisters at Châtillon, she crosses the threshold of 140 Rue du Bac on the 21st of April, 1830, and follow her formation program as one of 112 novices. This is Catherine's signature, written when she entered the company in 1830. Catherine will stay at Rue du Bac for 10 months. And it is here that she will have the most extraordinary experience. Preserved in the archives of Rue du Bac is the written account of the events we will be unfolding. The account which, much later on, Catherine will write down on three different occasions in 1841, 1856 and 1876. These extraordinary happenings will be depicted in countless statues, pictures and stained glass windows. It is Catherine's own words, written by her own hand, that we'll be using as we follow Catherine on the night of July 18th, 19th, 1830. At half past eleven at night, I heard someone calling me. Sister! Sister! Pulling back the curtain, I saw a child of about four or five years of age, dressed in white. Get up quickly and come to the chapel. The Blessed Virgin is waiting for you. But they'll hear me. Don't worry. Everyone is asleep. I followed the child. Everywhere we went, we found the lights on. God wakes us from our dreams. He shows us paths of light. But maybe we do not recognize his call. 
When I entered the chapel, I could see nothing of the Blessed Virgin. The child led me to the priest's chair. I knelt down, but the child remained standing. I found the time passing slowly. Here is the Blessed Virgin. Here she is. I heard a sound, like the rustle of a silk dress. Here is the Blessed Virgin. I couldn't see her. Then the child spoke to me in a louder voice, and this time he sounded more like a man. Here is the Blessed Virgin. It was then that I recognized her. We have to see with the heart, move away from the familiar, break out of our selfishness, venture beyond our certainties. We have to see with the heart. With one leap, I was at her side. I knelt down, and my hands were resting on her knees. I stayed there some time, the sweetest moments of my life. I cannot describe what I experienced. She told me how I was to act towards my director in my trials, and some other things which I am not to disclose. This meeting and sharing takes place in an atmosphere of total trust, freedom, and love. God wishes to confide to you a mission. You will have much to suffer. You will be contradicted, but you will be given grace. Do not fear. Tell everything in trust and in simplicity to the one who is appointed to guide you. Have confidence. Everyone is given a mission, and nothing is accomplished without difficulty. What is my mission? There will be bad times coming, and catastrophes will rain down over France. The cross will be held in contempt. The streets will be running with blood. The whole world will be plunged into sadness. The Blessed Virgin couldn't go on. Her face showed the grief she felt. Mary suffers when she sees her children destroying themselves. Mary suffers when she sees people using their liberty to choose evil. Every Christian life must engage in the combat against all that corrupts the heart or affronts human dignity. Come to the foot of this altar. Their graces will be poured out on all those, small or great, who ask for them with confidence and fervor. Mary points to the altar and to the tabernacle where Jesus is in the Eucharist. As a Cana, Mary seems to say, Do whatever he tells you. Every year, Two million pilgrims come to pray at the foot of this altar, offering... I don't know how long I stayed there. The child said... She is gone. I went back to bed and heard two o'clock strike. I didn't go back to sleep. A meeting that lasted two and a half hours. A mission. Catherine talks to her confessor, Father Aladell, about it. Forget about these visions, sister. Just do well what you have been asked to do. That is your mission. Four months later, the second apparition will complete the message given in the previous one. On Saturday, 27th November, 1830, Catherine is in the chapel at half past five in the evening, praying silently for the other novices. She seems to hear a slight sound coming from the right. The Blessed Virgin was standing there, dressed in white. Her face was so beautiful I couldn't possibly describe it. She was wearing a silk dress that was as white as the dawn. 